Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your grace this day. We're thankful for your love and mercy. Lord, we're thankful for passages such as this that help us to walk circumspectly, to be upright, to follow the leading of your spirit in our lives and how it plays out in body-wide and church-wide and worldwide. Lord, we ask now your favor upon us as we study your word. Grow us in grace in the areas that we need transformation in, Lord. Would you draw us to your presence, give us strength to confess and be the people of God you called us to be. And we pray all these things in the blessed and precious and mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the people say, Amen. Amen. All right, kiddos, you're free to head on out. And uh, you big kids, if you would, turn off your cell phones or silence them, please, so we don't have that distraction. And uh, then we're going to look at this message I've entitled, The Poisoned Tongue. The Poisoned Tongue. <clears throat> please make sure that you have your Bibles open in front of you or your notes, because we're going to do a little bit of exercise here this morning in your notes. And if you're one of those people that like to write and mark in your notes, I've got the perfect time for you. And it's going to come in verse 6. So get yourself ready. That's only two verses into our message. So it should be coming up, but that's about 20 minutes from now. So hang on. Just warning you. All right. This morning we're looking at the title message, The Poisoned Tongue. And that dude needs to shave up there, doesn't he? <laughs> I don't know if you know who this man is. John Wooden. He was the head basketball coach of the UCLA Bruins. And he is the antithesis of most basketball coaches today. He seldom left his seat when he was coaching the Bruins of UCLA. Wooden stated one time, I tried to teach my players that if, you lose, if they lose their temper, they're going to get beat. Wooten also went on to state, I tried to, uh, modeling is better than words. I like the rule that we used to have that a coach couldn't leave the bench. I'm sorry they did away with that. Now you think about that for a moment, and my goodness, I watched K-State basketball, and, you know, and the coach there, he's halfway out on the floor, you know, almost tripping people. It's like, goodness sakes, that's, that's quite a difference between Wooten sitting on a bench and then others are out there almost halfway out on the floor. Wooten has set records that may never be broken in college basketball. From 1948 to 1975, he had a win-loss record of 885 wins and 203 losses. That phenomenal career has a percentage winning, a winning percentage of 813, 0 .813. That is a lot of wins, folks, and that is a high percentage, especially for basketball. He had an 88-game win winning streak at UCLA that will probably never be broken by any coach in any team. Players such as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Walton, and Walt Hazard played under him at UCLA. When he was interviewed, uh, probably around 2000, about 10 years before he passed away, he had the, the opportunity to be critical about Bobby Knight, who is the gentleman that's pictured in the second one yelling at the ref. He had the opportunity to disparage and tear down Bobby Knight, but Wooden would only say, I think Bobby Knight is an outstanding teacher of the game. I just don't approve of his methods. But I'm not a judge, nor am I judging Bob Knight. There is so much bad in the best of us and so much good in the worst of us it hardly behooves me to talk about the rest of us. What Wooden was getting at was the fact that he recognized his own fallenness and his own nature that he could drift into being very critical of other people. And what he did was he simply zipped it. Today, we're going to look at this section of scripture that deals with the tongue, that deals with all of us who have an issue, that we all have this little muscle in our mouth that can do great damage to other people 
and to society itself. The section of scripture that James is talking about here is not very nice, folks. It has no positive in encouragement in this scripture text that we're looking at here this morning. From verse 5 to verse 12, there is nothing positive. It is all negative that deals with this issue of the tongue among us. James is hard-hitting when it comes to the truth of the tongue and its use among us. And we should be also in recognizing this issue of the tongue among us. And so therefore, as we gather ourselves together here to talk about this, I want you to grab the seatbelt that's next to you and strap in and follow along with me as we deal with this issue of the tongue in the church. Now, as James begins this section, I want you to notice here that he talks about that the tongue can become an instrument, not just an instrument, but an instrument of boasting. An instrument of boasting. Now look, I get it. I'm proud of my kids' accomplishments. Whatever they, they're doing, whether they're athletics, academic, uh, being an up, upstanding Christian citizen by opening the doors for other people. You are opening the doors for other people, right? Okay. Uh, helping others out, volunteering, all those kind of things. I am so proud of that in my kids. But it doesn't lead me to boast that my kids are any better than your kids. Because I know that's not the case. Because I know that we're all fallen. That we all fail at times, so to speak. And so I'm not going to set my kids or myself or anybody else up for failure to boast that I am better and you know, higher and, and run faster than anybody else. But when James begins to address the tongue as a part of the body that boasts of great things, he looks at it in terms of the negative aspect of it, that it is negative. Notice in verse 5 and 6, So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Now, here's what I, I want to give you an interesting tip here. The human tongue weighs 2.4 ounces. Think about that for a minute. You guys go to the steakhouse and eat a larger filet than a 2.4 ounce tongue. Think about this for a minute. Our tongue weighs approximately 2.4 ounces, but yet its destructive power has enough power to bring down careers and even nation states around the world. A 2.4 ounce destructive piece of flesh. And James calls this piece of flesh fiery. Notice in the text. The tongue is such a small part of the body. It, gross, it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Verse 6. And the tongue is a fire. It is that one that sparks things and gets things roaring. Let me give you an example of destruction. This past December, out in California, there was a fire called the Thomas Fire. And it burned over 270,000 acres of land in Ventura and Santa Barbara County, which is northwest of L.A. Taking the footprint of that burn area, a person has placed that over the city of Los Angeles. And there's the map that you see behind us. That burn area stretches from Malibu, which is right here, over to the Inland Empire where Jody and my family lived for 11 and a half years. It stretches from Burbank all the way down here south of Norwalk, this area in here, the 91 freeway. 270,000 acres. That's 421 square miles of burnt property. Thousands of homes. Life's lost. And how did this thing start? By one spark. They're investigating that it might have spark started in two spots and merged into one, but they do know and have confirmed that a transformer blew up 
And a small spark flew from the transformer, landed in the field or the, the, the wilderness area there, started that fire, and it burnt all of this stuff, all of this acreage. Why do I share this for you? Because the fact that all of this came together in one small spark started this fire. And James is using that, that idea of a small spark starting a large blaze like this with the tongue. The tongue is a fire through which our speech we wield great destruction. Not only in our own lives, but the lives of our spouses, our children, our families, our, our, you know, our neighborhood, our churches, our workplace, our government. It is affected by our speech everywhere. And so therefore, as Christians, we need to make sure that we are up to the task of this 2.4 ounce muscle between our teeth to keep it in check. But I want you to know something. You, my friend, cannot keep this in check. You have to have an outside source of help because the Bible is absolutely replete with warnings and descriptions of the destruction that the tongue can bring. Notice the Proverbs. Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. So whenever a problem is dealt with, a person who is righteous stops, slows down, thinks through the process looks for an avenue of direction that's going to be best for all involved. But it says here that the wicked just pours out just wicked and vile things out of their mouth to deal with the problem. It's like, a, it's like a, a, an employer or a boss that's struggling and stressed out, and then when, a, when a, you know, an employee comes to them with a problem, they just like, get the, ah, I can't stand this! And just like, ah! Instead of stopping and going, okay, let's back the bus up, find out where the train got off the rails, try to put it back on, and move forward in health. Proverbs 16, 27. A worthless man digs up evil while his words, look at the picture here, are like a scorching fire. Proverbs 26, 20, and 21. The lack of wood, the fire goes out. We all know that. You go camping, you have a fire, you go to bed at night, and then when you get up in the morning, there's no fire because the wood burned out. We all know that. Where there's no whisperer, the contention dies down. Verse 21, like charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. And that contentiousness is used through the mouth to speak to other people. David in the psalmist says, my soul is among lions. Now, David is out in the wilderness running. And he's looking back at his life. And he's seeing the people around him. He says, my soul is among the lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire. The picture there. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows. And their tongue is a sharp short sword. Now, I want you to notice this uh, militaristic language here. Fire, arrows, spears, and a sword. That's what David felt like that was coming against him because of the language being used out of the mouths of those that opposed him. Psalm 52. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking what is right, you love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue. And the tongue can be greatly deceitful in our time, in our day and age. So we need to make sure that we are careful on the use of our tongue, not only in the way we speak to individuals around us, but in groups in our families or large groups in our churches or our employment, or even when we're out there on the internet even. When whatever you're typing behind your screen, you think that's kind of innocent? It's crazy. Some of the garbage that's out there. You know what? I got, I got so tired of social media that I turned off all my notifications, all that stuff that goes on there. So if you're going to get a hold of me, don't do it through Facebook because you're going to have a long wait. You either call me or text me. I'm done with social media. Even though I'm Facebook living this right now, 
I got all my, all my notifications turned off. I'm done with it. Okay. I, right now, I am going on a social media fast. I'm stopping that other than uploading the things that need to be in our church through prayer, maybe a sermon, a Genesis series, whatever it is, that's what you're going to get from me and the rest, I'm done. And maybe, maybe, if the rest of us follow suit, the world might be a better place. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I want to show you how destructive, how destructive words are. And I want to share with you a riddle. See if you can figure this riddle out. It's, it's, it comes from um, a guy by the name of Morgan Blake, who was quoted by John MacArthur in his uh, commentary on James chapter 3. And I want to share it with you and see if you can figure this out. Here it is. I am more deadly than the screaming shell from the howitzer. I win without killing. I tear down homes, break hearts, and wreck lives. I travel on the wings of the wind. No innocence is strong enough to intimidate me. No purity pure enough to daunt me. I have no regard for truth, no respect for justice, no mercy for the defenseless. My victims are as numerous as the sands of the sea and often as innocent. I never forget and seldom forgive. My name is... Gossip. What? Gossip. Gossip. My name is Gossip. Every one of us have been guilty of this sin. We've spoken out of turn about some other people that we were not supposed to share, whatever it was. One of the things that I make sure that we want to do is make sure that when people are posting things to our prayer section of our Facebook page, is that please, please, please get the person's permission before you post anything. Because some people are very private and they don't want that out there. Some people live out there. I get it. The two extremes. But please, if you're ever going to post something, make it a habit that you ask the person first before you post anything. We would appreciate that. And I know that they would too before getting it out there. But I want you to notice here something. This idea of gossip is something that we have all involved ourselves in. Under the guise of, hey, we're taking prayer requests. Um, anybody have any prayer requests? Oh, have you heard about? And here we go. Okay. Have you gotten the permission of that person to share it in that group? There's the key to the whole thing. So please, under the guise of spirituality, please don't gossip. But please share and please pray for one another because we all, we all need it. We all need prayer. We all do. So James calls this tongue a fiery tongue, but also I want you to notice he calls it a defiling tongue, that which defiles. Our own tongues defile ourselves, and then it also spills over and defiles other people as well. I want you to notice, now we get to verse 6. Okay, Now, if you have your Bibles, or you have your little notes, I want you to get out verse 6. And we're going to break this down for you. This is how you do Bible study. This is how you do sermon prep. You elders in training and those that are trying to learn to do the uh, sermon material and all that. This is how you do stuff like this. You look at the text and you begin to break it down into smaller components. And then you build it all back up together. I want this morning to break this thing, this thing down to its smaller components for you. Verse 6. I'm not going to have it on the overhead. You've got to look at your text. So welcome to Bible study. Here we go. Verse 6 reads this. Concentrate on it. The tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. And sets on fire the course of our life. And that is set on fire by hell. Now, four components I want to break down for you. Here we go. Number one, you need to circle or underline the world of iniquity. The world of iniquity. Now, when James uses that term cosmos, world, he's not talking about the earth as the world. What he's talking about here is a system, a system of thinking, a system of speaking, a system of doing. 
It's the way we operate. That's what he's talking about when he uses the word cosmos. So he says this systematic way of thinking or doing is a world of iniquity. The tongue is that. Now this word iniquity, adikia, is, is injustice. What it is, is it's not conformable to justice. That which ought to be is not. Meaning that this thing that the tongue does is absolutely wrong. That's the first thing you need to understand about the tongue. It's a world of iniquity. It's a world that does not conform to justice. The second thing that you need to understand and highlight out of chapter verse 6 is that you need to underline or highlight defiles the entire, and I would circle the word entire, body. Circle the word entire. Now when James uses this, he's talking about not just a specific general defiling. This is systemic. It is throughout the whole body. It's like when you contract a virus, cold, flu, whatever it is, you don't have a finger flu virus. You don't have a virus that just kind of locates in your toe and that's it. It becomes systemic. It affects your whole entire body. Your respiratory system, your headaches, your muscles, all of that, just it, it, it just tears at the whole entire body until you're run down and you gotta crash and try to rebuild. That's what he's saying the tongue does. It defiles the entire body. And I wanna show you how Jesus expresses this in Mark chapter seven, verses 20 to 23. Notice. This is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who stepped out of eternity into our world. This is how he is describing the state of humankind. Notice what he says here. And he, that he refers to Jesus, was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that which comes out of us, that is what defiles the man. Not whether you got dirty feet or dirty hands while you eat a sandwich. See, that was the problem the Pharisees had with it. Well, you, your disciples didn't ritually clean their hands while they ate their meal. Now, granted, how many of you have gotten everything off your hands before you got your sandwich eaten? Probably not all of us. Okay? George, I know you worked on cars, and I know you've probably eaten a lot of grease sandwiches, brother. Okay? Just like, man, I'm hungry, didn't get all off, but boom, I'm, I'm eating there. We've all done that. We've all been there. See, the problem here is, is that they thought it was the outside, and Jesus is pointing to the real nature of it. It's on the inside. And then he goes on to say, verse 21, For from within, inside of us, out of the heart, of men proceed, and notice what he says here, evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. And look at verse 23, the capstone of Jesus' teaching here in verse 23. All of these, which he just described, all of those things up there, Evil, he calls them evil things, proceed from within and defile that person. So the real state, when we talk about this, when we deal with doctrine, when we look at the heart of man and the nature of man, anthropology is the term that we use in doctrine to look at man. We have to deal with the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is what, doctrine class? Sin. It is sin is the problem. How do we deal with that? How did Jesus deal with that idea of sin? Because sin using that 2.4 ounce piece of muscle in our body defiles the entire body. It defiles the entire body. The third thing that you need to look for in verse 6 here is you need to underline the course of life that is set on fire. That is the tongue sets on fire the course of our life. Now, there is a course that all of us live and walk and, and, and are navigating in life. 
Some of us are looking for a career path. That's our course, wherever God has us on that course. And what James is saying is that the tongue will set that course ablaze even out into the future. Why? Because you might say something here about somebody who's related to somebody, and then all of a sudden your relationships break down out there that you haven't even got to yet. Or maybe a career breaks down because you said something back here. And the tongue sets all of that on fire. And it destroys. And it's extremely destructive. You see, when he talks about the course of life, he's talking about the entirety of our life. He's talking about the life over the long haul. Not just this short moment where I got mad and I, you know, blew up and I said something out of my mouth and then that has no repercussions. Yes, it does. And it has great repercussions. You see, we're known, folks, unfortunately, by the way we talk. If you really, really want to know a person, listen to what they say. Listen to what they say. What's going on in their mind, in their heart, is going to eventually come out of their mouth. And it's going to really, truly tell you the character of that person. What are they talking about? How much are they talking about whatever it is that they are talking about? And now I'm, I've kind of got that thrown over here as a third person kind of way over there, but I'm going to dial it in for us here. Believer, you here today, let me ask you a couple of questions. What are you talking about? And how are you using that 2.4 ounce muscle in your mouth? Are you gossiping? Are you slandering someone else? Are you having false accusations against them? Are you having filthy cursing and lying come out of your mouth on the production line because you want to blend in with your buddies? Oops. You see, all of this that we use that comes from our mouth will destroy families. It will destroy schools. It will destroy personal relationships. It will destroy churches. We need to be careful about this tongue that we have in our mouth. Be careful how you use it. And the final and fourth thing out of verse 6 that I want you to see here is that the tongue is set on fire by hell. There is an origin, not only of what goes on inside of us, but there is a malevolent force outside of us that can be manipulative of us to misdirect our heart and to attack one another. The spewing forth of vile and nasty stuff that comes from our mouths is from a misdirected heart influenced by the pit. Our tongues can be used by the enemy as tools of evil. Be careful what you do. Let me ask you a question. How do conflicts start? Now, you've been in a conflict. Every one of us have. Whether you're in a spousal relationship, maybe in school or employment or whatever it is. Wherever you have two people, especially Baptists, you're going to have five opinions. Okay? But there is sometimes conflict that arises. How did that conflict start? How did it get going? Well, let me kind of show you, I think, how conflict starts. And it's not usually by some act of violence. I say usually. Typically, how it gets started is it's the use of language. You know, the, I'm going to do this to you. Or, you know, back in the, back in the day on the, on the playground, yo mama, oh yeah, where's your daddy? And away it goes and it just ramps up. And then next thing you know, somebody's gotten tired of whatever's going on and then it's like, Ah! And then away we go. And there's a phys physical altercation and all that. So it spills over from language that ramps up and then spills over into violence where the insulting of the parental units or our heritage is often uh, the case that gets us to that point. Posturing, bloviating, rhetoric, all of that. And then the next thing you know, you go up and you use the term today, well, let's square up. 
and go at it. The other day I was watching on, uh, on Fox News, these two morons, I don't know what they were doing, I guess they had some road rage thing, it was out in California, of course out in California, uh, sorry California people that are watching this, uh, these two guys on the freeway, you know, the, the freeways out there are like parking lots, so there must have been some driver rage or something, but they, they get, the, you know, the traffic just comes to a standstill. Well, these two morons thought, well, I'm just going to like MMA it right out here on the, on the freeway. So both of them jump out of their car. It was a younger guy, maybe in his maybe 30s, and an older guy, like my age. And they're out there just going at it. The, the older guy was a little bit bigger than the, the smaller guy, but the smaller guy is faster, quicker, just dee -dee 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 just going at him, beating this guy. And finally, he got the bigger guy on the ground and was going to go after him. And some guy on a motorcycle pulled up, jumped off his bike, the Good Samaritan, while everybody else was filming it to put it on YouTube, the guy on the motorcycle jumps off and intervenes and pushes the guys away. And you know what they did? Both those morons got in their car and drove off. What did that prove? Nothing. It was just an altercation, and I don't know what started it. No one, no one knows, but there it just spills over onto the freeway. You know, folks, here's the problem. Here's the problem. We live, and whether you agree with this or not, we live in a violent culture. We live in a violent culture. You look at what is being pumped out of Hollywood in terms of violence on the screen. You look at the storylines in the news. You look at what's going on in domestic violence in homes and how we take it upon ourselves to uh, go after people in a vigilante sense and have a beat down. You look at the video games that young people are playing today, first person shooters that, you know, it, there's, there's no consequence. You just go in there and shoot characters and then you, you go home. Now, look, lest you guys who are on our security team and part of you know law enforcement and all that, I am not a gun-grabbing advocate. Matter of fact, I got a lot of guns. I like guns. I shoot guns. They're fun. Guns aren't the problem. You know where the problem lies? In the heart. And in the mind, it's broken. There's the problem. So don't blame it on an instrument because you can take anything, any instrument and use it as a weapon. The first murder that happened in the Bible, Cain killing Abel. He didn't have an AR-15 then. What did he have? He had a rock right over the head. Which reminds me of that instance that guy tried to break in, two guys tried to break in a store and one hit the thing and brick bounced off and his friend throws one and bashes him right inside the head and knocks him out. I was hilarious. I, last night, I couldn't quit laughing. I was so like, my gosh, you could use anything for an act of violence. Please pray for one another. Pray for our country. Matter of fact, I want to stop right now. I want to stop right now, and I would like for us to be silent for a moment. And I want to play, I want to pray for Parkland, Florida, and the families that were so devastated by what went in down there. And folks, we have a crisis in our culture that stems from violence and a dead heart. And the church has the solution. It's called the gospel. It's called the gospel. Would you take a moment with me, just in a moment of silence, and let's pray for Parkland, Florida right now. Father, we pray for the community of Parkland, Florida. And Father, they are under a lot of stress right now with burying loved ones who so tragically died in this incident in the high school. And Father, for whatever reason the evil reared its head there, we know that you're greater than that. And Lord, I pray in this moment that you would comfort those that grieve that are all the funerals that are happening this next week, God, would you touch the lives of those people? And Lord, I pray for the church. 
in that area to arise and be the church. Love, care for, provide for, pay for even the things that are needed to bring about a healing so that the glory of Christ may advance in that part of our country. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to pray. And we ask your blessing and grace upon the church so that we might be the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The second thing that James wants us to understand about this idea of the tongue is that it's an instrument of poison. An instrument of poison. Look at verse 8 of our text. No one can tame the tongue. We already mentioned that. You as an individual cannot tame your own tongue. You have to have an outside influence. He says that this tongue is a restless evil and it's full of deadly poison. Now, here's what's interesting. Circle the word restless in your text there. That restless evil describes something that will never stop. It's never satisfied. The Greek word here is a picture of a chained wild animal that is always always try to find or tug its way out of its captivity. It is absolutely restless and will never stop till it finds a way out. And that's what he's saying here, that the tongue is restless. It's always on. It never stops. It's never satisfied. And because the tongue can become a raging fire, uncaged, full of evil, we should heed the words of David. When he wrote in the Psalms these words, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, and keep watch over the door of my lips. Now you all have heard your mamas and your grandmas say, if you don't have anything nice to say, what? Don't say it at all. Set a guard over your lips. Put a muzzle on it. You know, some people are like, yeah, put a muzzle on it. No, we would just say, zip it. Okay? You've got to be quiet here. The reason... Because in Galatians 5.17, Paul says the flesh, that 2.4 ounce piece of flesh that we have, sets its desire against the spirit. There is a conflict going on. That's why you cannot tame this tongue. You need the spirit because it's fighting against that. And you need to wield control of your tongue over to the spirit. You've got to give that up. The spirit and the flesh are fighting, for these are in opposition to one another, Paul says, so that you may not do the things that please, that you please. Now, I have never heard in my lifetime, in 26 years as a pastor, that a Christian who is uh, dedicated and transformed in the faith would say, I don't want to please God. I have never heard that from a true believer. We want to please God. But the flesh holds us back, and so we need to, to give over those desires to the control of the Holy Spirit in us. And the way we do that is every day that you get out of bed and you flip your feet over and you about get out of bed, you say, God, I'm about to mess my day up, and I need you to take control of my mind and my heart so that I might walk in your ways today and fulfill 1 Corinthians 10.31, which says... Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, do all for the glory of God. And then you get out of bed and you start your day. And then you ask yourself over and over throughout the day, have I glorified God in, and then you fill in the blank, whatever it is you've been doing, have I glorified God in that? The second thing I want you to understand in this uh, instrument of poison is not only is the tongue evil, but it's also hypocritical. And notice how James describes this in verse 9 and verse 10. He says, with it, with this 2.4 ounce piece of flesh, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse other people who are created in the likeness of God. From the same mouth, he says, both blessings and cursings come forth. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. It's two-faced. On one time, we look at God and say, yes, God, I trust you. I'm praising you. I'm glorifying you. And then we turn around 
and we scream and we yell and we curse those around us created in the image of God. That is hypocritical. And I want to show you from Scripture an instance of the leader of the early church that this happened to. Peter, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, he said, when asked who Jesus was, the disciples said, oh, some say this, some say that, some say you. And Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, rightly so, you've said that, Peter. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven revealed that to you. So he was riding a spiritual wave. Woo! Ten chapters later, after the arrest in the garden, while Jesus is illegally being tried in the house of Caiaphas, Peter is in the courtyard warming himself by the fire, and a little girl, servant girl, comes up and says, Hey, aren't you one of those guys? Peter said, Nope, not me. A little bit later, she comes back and says, Hey, aren't you one of those guys? Nope, get away from the kid. Finally, she comes up and says, Hey, I know you've got a Galilean accent. You are one of his followers. You know him. And look what the text says in verse 74. Peter says, Cursing and swearing, I do not know the man. What happened to you, Peter? What happened? And immediately the rooster crowed, and he remembered the words of Jesus. Before the rooster crows this night, you're going to die me three times, Peter. And I want you to notice how broken he was when he found that out. He went out of the courtyard. And one of the writers, the gospel writers, tell us that when that happened, there was a line between Jesus and Peter. And Jesus turned and looked at him and said, I told you so. Peter left, weeping bitterly that he had betrayed and denied his Lord. And every time that we use our mouth to curse other people. We're denying the lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. Be careful what you do with your tongue. And then the final area that James wants to point to, which comes in 11 and 12, is some questions. They're illustrations of contradictions. James reaches into nature here to show how ridiculous these contradictions of blessing and cursing were in a believer's life. It shouldn't be this way. And he uses four illustrations and he uses some questions. Oh, and by the way, class, I'm going to give you the answers to the quiz today. And the answers to the quiz are all no. So remember that. When a question comes up, the answer is going to be what? No. no. All right, here we go. He asks the questions. Verse 11. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Class? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or vines produce figs? No. And then he doesn't couch it in this last part, but I will couch it in a, in a question. Can salt water produce fresh, class? No. no, it cannot. Congratulations, you got an A plus for today. Yeah, you can go home and beat the people out to Sternloin Stockade and have a meal. James must have had his older brother's, older half-brother's teachings in mind when he was dealing with this. Because notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Let me rephrase this in our vernacular today within the church. A Christian cannot produce evil fruit, nor can an evil or unbeliever produce fruit that looks like a Christian. <coughs> Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20, kind of the capstone of this whole thing. So then, church, you will know them by their what? Fruits. It goes back to what I told, what I just asked you. Find out what the person is talking about, and their fruit will come forth from their mouth. And they will either speak well and good of others, or they will speak evil and ill of others. You will know them 
by their fruits. Really what we should be doing is being fruit inspectors. We don't work for the FDA. We work for heaven. And we are the spiritual FDA. Look to people's fruit in their life. And you will know whether they are truly followers of Christ. And whether they are not. And I want to tell you here this morning. If you are here this morning. And you are playing a game with God. And you are living a Christian life. Trying to live a Christian life. And you're acting and speaking while you're around believers. Like a believer. And then when you go home. And you are tearing your spouse down. And you are cursing. And have filthiness in your mouth and all that. I would take a check about your spiritual life. And I would tell you to repent. And get right with God. That would be my advice to you. Now I don't know that. I'm not, I'm not the spirit of God. I don't know that in your life. I don't convict. I don't draw and I don't save. I am just simply the messenger. And I'm just saying, look at the fruit and look at your talk. And does it line up with what truly is a transformed believer? Ask that question. Now, I've got some application points I want to bring up here for you. Three of them. And they're really hard-hitting questions. And I'm not going to give you the answers to these. Oh, God. You've got to answer these. With your own life, your own lifestyle, the own way of you doing it. Number one, is there any ungodly boasting going on in your life? Now, notice I said ungodly boasting. Not just boasting about grandkids and their sports endeavor or their, you know, piano recital and all that. I'm talking boasting, evilly. Evilly? Is that a word? Evilly? I don't think that's a word, but I just made that up. Is there any evil boasting going on in your life that's unrighteous? Number two. What is coming out of your mouth these days that could be defiling your whole body, your whole existence? What are you going through? Disagreements? Ugly divorce? Bad relationship with the boss? Maybe it's a difficulty with that honoring neighbor next door that keeps taking your kids' toys and won't give them back once they go over the fence. Whatever it is, I don't know. I don't walk in your world. You walk in your world. Is there anything that is coming out of your mouth that could be defiling you currently, right now? And then finally, are you acting or speaking in a hypocritical way towards others or God? Does your life measure up with Scripture? And have you truly been transformed if you have not and if you're struggling and you're wondering if this Christian thing is real I call you to come and give your life to Christ we sang about it come to the altar Christ is there waiting to help you I don't call you he does and again I'm just simply the messenger to deliver the message that Christ loves you and wants to spend time with you. Come to the altar. And go to the world and engage your icons. Come to the altar and go be the church. Go be the church. Praise team, won't you come on back up and let's close in prayer as we contemplate this today and then throughout the rest of this week. Father, we're grateful for your grace today. We thank you that you love us and care for us deeply. Father, we pray that you just take our lives, our hearts, our minds, our instruments, and use them for your glory. That, Lord, you would raise up a mighty church that would go and be the church. There would be people of prayer, people that would provide, people that would uh, move among those that are needy in their spiritual journey. God, you stir up passion for the lost. Help us understand that, God, the church has a place this day to be the triumphant warrior spiritually in our culture. God, let us arise and be the church this day. We pray all these things in the blessed and precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.